but let, let, let's just start. So welcome to the presentation. I'm Sergey. I'm going to talk about something totally different comparing to, to, to all the previous years. I wanted to make it some short and easy and understandable for everyone. Not going into all those crazy details of task scheduler and everything. Like, who cares about them? Anyway, it's all hidden underneath the, the blender. So in today's presentations, yeah, as usual, the same topics. My area of interest didn't change this year too much. So we're going to talk about open sub diff, dependency, dependency graph and cycles. So let's just get straight into it. So open sub diff. Well, actually, before we start, can I just wonder who is its first year Blender conference? Oh, OK. So then maybe there is so so something interesting for you. OK, that's good. So open sub diff and like, for those who didn't know what it is, it's, it's more optimized uh, subdivision surface engine which runs on GPU. And it's, it's in Blender since a year now. And for the, for the past year, we, we've been mainly working on, on fixing all those little bugs, which, which are hardware dependent and everything. And did some improvements for performance, trying to minimize the, the latency between your modified topology and you get the result back to on, on your viewport. And finally, we have UV map support, which took us a bit to, to, to work things around because there was no support in, in uh, open subdiv side. So we needed to, to work around our own way to, to, to achieve this. But luckily now it's open subdiv 3.1 released, so we can get rid of our hacks. And also like small fixes here and there. You can't remember everything. So how does open subdiv work under the hood? So first of all, you have some CPU side which basically analyzes your topology and sees which, which type of faces you have, what the connectivity between vertices and everything. And it's after, by doing this, it's also built so-called patches, like subdivision patches, which basically rectangular, regular rectangular thing give you subdivision points on them. And it's only, it, it's only happening once on CPU when you change topology. Once you have analyzed mesh, all this data gets pushed to GPU side, and it's GPU who is responsive for, for tessellating the actual patch and doing a shading on top of the, of, of the patch. So that's basically how it works. And what does actually this mean? So this means that, the, that open subdiff will always require some CPU preprocessing part, so you, you, you cannot avoid some latency between you know, when you change topology, basically. And it also means that, that open subdiff will always require some decent support of your GPU. So if, if, if your GPU does not support tessellation shaders or does not support uh, so some stuff you use for, for, for shading, it, you, you wouldn't see any option to use open subdiff, even the CPU option to use it for open subdiff in, in, in the user preferences. So that, 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 that's why sometimes you see, OK, why well, I have a decent CPU. Why cannot I use CPU tessellation in, in, in for open subdivision? Well, because it's not faster than legacy open, as legacy subdivision surface code. And it cannot be, be, be used because you still need support of, of GPU for that. So just be aware. And uh, to, 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 to check your OpenGL version, I think it's requirement 3.0, and you can check it in, in help save system info, and it's, it'll be written there. OK, so related now to open subdiff, let's get a bit in, in, into this, H how selection works in Blender. So in CPU side, you create so-called off-screen buffer. You say, OK, I want to draw OpenGL not in the screen, but in some memory buffer. Then you actually draw viewport to this frame buffer. And you don't really know what side it happens because it depends on various things. So we'll get back to this in the next slide. Uh, and, and then Blender gets back to CPU side to check which, which exact pixel was clicked and what's the, the object under that pixel. And it will select that object. So that side on which drawing is happens actually depends on this setting. So there are three options. First one is automatic which is now works for me. It doesn't pick up proper selection mode for me for some reason. I, some unspeakable object. The reason there is Anthony somewhere here. Maybe he can explain me after, uh, after the talk. 
So the OpenGL select is the, is the legacy code, which works on every hardware. It doesn't require any, anything fancy from your GPU. But downside of it is that it's purely CPU side. So when you have some decent shader usage, they will be all evaluated on CPU side, which is not necessarily fast. So what this means for open subdiv is that all the heavy mesh processing, which usually happens on, on fast GPU, is now happening on CPU, which gives you huge latency when you try to select open subdiv mesh. And there is another thing which is called OpenGL occlusion queries, which now works quite stable. I think I, 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 I don't remember any issues in this area like in the past months. Didn't see any reports on it. And this is actually the, the, the dude which you wanted to use because it doesn't go to CPU side to draw off screen open subdiff mesh. So there is no latency anymore. So that's one of the tips. I like, actually didn't count tips, so let's just go, go through them and just, don't, don't worry. So, yes, if this is the thing too, is if, if, you, like, if you use open subdiff, use this guy for selection and maybe for, for some heavy scenes, this is also the good choice to, to, to use because then you, don't, you, you reduce latency of selection and heavy scenes. Okay, so and what's going to happen to open subdiff in, 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 in the next year? It's uh, hopefully with 2.8 branch where we will be bumping open GL requirement to a much newer version where we can have uh, tessellation shaders and geometry shaders working together without any hacks and workarounds, then we can finally support proper smooth shading by, 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 by evaluating smooth normal on GPU side, because currently it's some approximation which does not necessarily work. And there are also plans to reconsider how it's open subdiff is integrated into, into modifier stack. So, uh, Currently, the problem is when you try to, to combine some parenting to, to mesh and subdivide that mesh, which forces you to, 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 to CPU side of evaluation, which is not real great. So we're going to change that and make it probably some viewport option or render engine option or whatever it's going to be in 2.8 branch. OK, so that's it for the, for, for the open subdiff. Let's talk about dependency graph. And here I wouldn't. I don't know, nobody understands it anyway, so just so, some quick notes, just some little things. So what happened to dependency graph? Well, not much, not much visible. We've been just fixing lots of bugs in there. And what to get for, for fixing bugs, you have a of thousand bones, and then you try to figure it out why sometimes some bone pops up. Yeah, very fun debug, like two weeks in debug mode for one single rig, and then you have 10 reports about this. Yeah, very productive spend of time. But we are getting more and more close to the point where we can just declare, OK, this is the dependency graph we're going to to make it official one and just get rid of old one. It doesn't work anyway. So the, the, the good milestone here is that we switched Blender Institute to new dependency graph by default. So now the full studio, all the artists work with new dependency graph, which is kind of stressful for me because it's only me for team of four, four, four artists who, who does rigs and animation and things sometimes don't work for them. And sometimes it doesn't work for all of them, so there is a line of four people waiting for me to do a bug fix. But last couple of fixes, it became OK. Like no, no big issues in there, so that's good. So maybe we can enable a default in master like soon, or maybe make it default into point eight branch and get rid of legacy one. So yeah. Um, so relations debugging, how do you debug your relations, actually? That's a good question. <laughs> no, there, there is no way, fortunately. You can try, but it usually don't work. So in Blender, it's the same story, so you cannot easily debug dependencies. And the only thing which tells you that you have some issues in your rig is the system console. There is no interface for, for, for reporting some dependency cycles, which is the, the biggest issue for, for, for your rig and your scene. So generally, rule of thumb, like when you have something weird happening, you just check your system console. If there is some 
dependency cycles reported to the, to, to the console. Read, read through the cycle, it, it'll, it, it'll tell you what exact modifiers or constraints or objects are in that dependency cycle. And if you find that it's, it's a fake dependency one, like it was detected as some weird thing, some weird relation might be created by dependency graph, like bugs happens, and then you just go to, to the bug track and report it and <laughs> poke the, the guy with nickname Sergey in there. And, but if, if that's a real dependency cycle, the, then there is not much we can do from our side, unfortunately. So the, the, then you can probably reconsider your rig or your constraint system or something like this to, to, to help you bug this. So if you, if you, do, if you go to, 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 to report this and it gets fixed, like the, the, the two can, Pelican tokens are welcome for those commits. Okay, and for, for plans, well, it's open sub if it's back, so it's, it, 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 it's a dependency graph. So, so step number one is, is to, I finally need to get back to, to ro working on the proposal for, for the overrides, local copies, copy on write, stripe and swipe and everything, and don't, don't listen to me. Yeah, yeah. That, that was like, stripe and swipe was technology, like the, 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 the word in, invented by him, so. Okay, and that step two is to implement that proposal and profit. Yeah. But we'll see how it goes. But I should I should get there because we are done with 2.70a release now, so should have more time now. Okay, let's talk about cycles. So I will just do some disclaimers later because there are some controversial topics in there. So basically, in cycles, the, the, the biggest change, I think, was the micro displacements from my, and she's somewhere here. No, there. And <laughs> like when I was working on the presentation, they didn't see the, the program, so I thought it would be some feature list presentation from cycles. I'm not sure if it's happening or not. So because I don't want to go into all the improvements in there, to be honest. You can just talk to me or someone else related to this. Like from, 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 I, from what I was working is, is the more realistic PBR, which is a hip word nowadays, more PBR, subsurface scattering, which is actually based on, on the approximation of physical measured cores and everything, which is kind of fun and lots of optimizations, mainly in BVH, which will get to, to, to this. And yeah, I can cover every, everything. So we'll just, like, what is BVH, actually? Does anyone know what BVH is? Oh, OK, a couple of guys. So BVH is basically an optimization structure which allows you to, to shoot the rays in the scenes to find the intersection between the ray and, and the scene more efficient. And it's basically the, the bounding hierarchy bounding volume hierarchy. So it's basically some bounding boxes, which are like starting from small one, which, which encloses small, small triangles and go bigger and bigger and bigger and covers more of your scene. So this is just the attempt to visualize BVH of, of the monkey in, in uh, BVH of cycles. So you can kind of see the, the hierarchy going up and up and up. So let's talk about spatial split option in the performance, like when you have to use this. So, and what the split BVH is. So, here we have an example of two, of two different, uh, of two triangles, which are fit into two different types of, of bounding boxes. So, first one is the bounding box, which, which surrounds one triangle at a time. And as you can see, there is a big, intersection between these two bounding boxes. So if you try to, to shoot rays somewhere here, you're doomed to, to find intersections between two bounding boxes and to check both triangles because you, you, you don't, like, if you, if you are here, you don't know if it actually hits red triangle or not. So on the, this extra intersection check slows down your render time. So there is another way to fit the, the, these triangles into BVH boxes by doing something like this. So now one triangle belongs to two different bounding boxes, which is less efficient from memory point of view. But then when whatever, wherever your ray hits, 
in, in, in the space. It only does one bounding box intersection check, which makes checks much faster. Well, it makes intersection check faster, but the, the, the overall run the time might be not, not, not so significantly faster. But usually it takes up to 10% faster in certain scenes. So, okay, let's not go into this yet. So basically, you, you always want to use split BVH. It, it, the downside of split BVH is that it requires more time to pre-process everything. So if, you, if you're using simple scenes, then probably you, you don't care which, which structure you use, but if it's a heavy scene, then, then 10 seconds more of pre-processing doesn't kill you because it gives you minutes of, of improvement. And then you need to render 1,000 frames, it accumulates to, to a quite decent amount of, of time. So just use split BVH for big scenes, as simple as that. Okay, and then... There was also things which is called hair BVH. Okay, so what's the idea here? So I tried to, to, to visualize hair strands with armature in Blender, just to make it more visible. And the, the, the regular nodes in BVH before all the changes in this area was that they're always axis aligned. So you always put the axis aligned bounding box around the, the hair strand, even though it's, it, it might be really long and stretchy and everything. And that's how the, the, it, it was originally implemented. The idea to, 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 improve, to improve the situation here, because you might see Ray somewhere here, and it hits bonding box, but it doesn't hit the, the, the hair itself. So what we can do is, uh, OK, so let's say that we can rotate the bonding box and scale it a little bit. So, we do this. These two non-axis aligned bounding boxes for, for the hair strands. And now the, the area where the ray will hit the bounding box, but will not hit the ray itself, is much smaller, which means you do much less intersection checks of ray to hair strand, which, which goes much faster. Like, you, if, 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 you, if you compare just a hair intersection, like right to, to, to scene intersections, it goes probably as fast as three times, maybe four times in, in some corner cases. So for hairy, really hairy characters, it helps a lot. Unfortunately, for, for this, you pay much more, like the penalty for achieving this is to store the orientation of, of the rotated bounding box. So we try to keep the memory footprint the same across the regular one and the, the rotated BVH things. But yeah, if he, sometimes you, you wanted to optimize your scene for memory and make your scene to fit into VRAM or into your physical memory. So for that thing, you can disable hair BVH in the performance panel, and you will gain up to 20% memory improvement for, 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 for the hair scene. So when you have hairy scene without, which doesn't fit into your, your graphics card, you can disable the hair BVH, gain more margin to, to fit your scene in there. Like being able to render at all is much better than just fancy data structure, but not being to render anyway. So that that's the, was the, the, the next tip. Okay, so let's jump to something totally different. Like all the hot topics, CPU versus GPU. Like, do I need to use CPU or GPU for a particular scene? And for, for, for the last months, we've been collecting some statistics on the, on the scenes and uh, on various hardware in the studio. And CPU is, like, for simple scenes, it, it, it seems to be much slower than, than the GPU. But then when you add complexity to the scene, like add hair stuff or add subsurface stuff to it, the, the, then that's where the, the CPU becomes much further the, than the GPU. I'm not sure if it's going to change anytime soon. Probably not, not really soon, because it, it, it's like just the way how the, the past tracing works in cycles. We can probably optimize something here, but in general, probably stick to, 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 to such things for, 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 for quite some time now. So what could be the decision here? Okay, so if you render some simple scenes, just go with GPU. If you, if, you, if you work on production movie type of scene, then 
the, the CPU is the way to go, actually. Oh, well, unfortunately. Um, so this is the 88 core CPU from, from Intel. No, it's dual. It's, it, it's dual Xeon and 88 threads in total. This is 56 threads in total. This is uh, 10 threads. And this is NVIDIA and AMD comparison. Yeah. I didn't have the, the up-to-date statistic from, from 1080s because Brecht was fixing some performance regressions in there. So we need to rerun this. Yeah, it's the same ballpark. And Victor Sins did not fit into, into these cards at all. So that's the thing. And ju 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 just to state the obvious, so GPUs are not magic bullets. So you need to be careful when you buy your GPU thinking, OK, I can render my movie scenes with these millions of hair strands with subsurface real fast. Well, not really. But for, 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 for some architectural visualization and stuff like this, it's, it's, it, it, it's quite a speed improvement. And another thing, which is a bit weird, is the branch pasteurizing, which claimed to be much slower, according to Andy. We can look into this because there are some stuff to this, which you'll see later today, like during these presentations. And the good thing for, for CPU is it's easier to predict the, 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 the render times once you add the, the more complexity to our scene. Like you, you, you think, OK, so we, we, we added two times more polygons in here. OK, the, the render time is probably going to be two times slower. Yeah, fair enough. On GPU, it, it, it's much less linear scale, which is unfortunate. So that's it for CPU versus GPU, I think. So, yeah, okay, yeah, it's, it, it, it's perfect. So, so tile order is, has direct impact on the performance. So to get best performance is, is, to, is to get bottom to top of Hilbert order, which is now, Hilbert is now default one. This is the guys to, 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 to get ultimate performance. Rendering from command line can gain up to 10%, maybe 5 to 10-ish percent, depending on variables. And if you're still rendering from interface, good tip would be to enable GLCL image draw method in the user preferences. It's a bit more stress when you're panning image around, but when you're rendering, it's much less stress on, on, on the CPU while you're rendering. OK, tile size. That's, that's the topic. So there is a hot discussions about our benchmark saying, like, hey, you didn't use the right tile size, well, because there is no right tile size for, 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 for all the GPUs around. It, it's going to vary around. General rules is that, is, is that for CPU, you wanted to keep them small. For GPU, you wanted to keep them big. As simple as that. And sometimes on GPU, when you run into some weird issues as timeout in the kernel, you might want to, to make them slower, smaller to, to speed up per tile around the time so you don't try run into, into time limit in, inside the tile. And this time limit we cannot solve because it's a driver side thing, which is control of NVIDIA only, or AMD, or Microsoft, depending on the driver operation system. OK, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is just stating the obvious. And OK, so let's go a bit deeper. So how does it uh, work internally? So each, each tile on GPU, like GPU works on one single tile, and each tile gets split into blocks of 16 by 16 pixels. And each multiprocessor, your graphics card has multi, have several multiprocessors, and each multiprocessor gets fixed amount of these 16 by 16 blocks and works on them simultaneously. And according to the specifications for, for the recent cards, like 900 and 1,000, it's for regular path tracing is five blocks per, per multiprocessing, and for branch path tracing is only four blocks per multiprocessor. So that's why branch path tracing might be slower. And each of the pixels in, in the block inside of the multiprocessor handle on different threads. And order of the schedule of the blocks in multiprocessor is not known. So simple rules. Keep your tile size a multiple of 16, so, so you, you don't run into, into things when you have some residue of two pixels 
of, of one, on one dimension and everything, all, all the rest of, the, of, of that block is being masqueraded because there are no pixels in there and those threads are just idling on the GPU. And so the, it's tricky one. Okay, so you wanted the, the integer, like you wanted to, your tile to be an integer amount of these thread blocks, of, of these blocks, depending on, 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 on your branch path tracing or regular path tracing. So for, for branch path tracing, you always want to, 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 to fit four, regular one is five blocks, and for like, like multiple of five blocks, and for, for branch path tracing, multiple of four. So there is a simple formula like for, for modern cards because I believe both 900 and 1000 has 20 multiprocessors and just multiply by 4 or 5 and that's how the amount of 16 by 16 blocks you need to have in, in the tile. But the disclaimer is, okay, so this is quite tricky to predict. So things which should work in theory not always works in, in practice. So sometimes you need to, to tweak some values according to your card and be happy. So. I think, actually, I was thinking, like, like I wanted to, to, to have maybe some answers to the questions, but apparently, last night, I learned that there is no Q&A session. <laughs> no, I, I, I give you answers. <laughs> yes, that's answers from my side, but I cannot give them because there is no Q&A. So I will be happy to, 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 to answer all the questions, like in, in, in the breaks and everything. But for now, I think that's it. And,